Thank you, Trevor. And um, as Trevor said, my name is Dion Rousseau. I'm the CEO of the Ethics Institute, who is a co-host of this event. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about uh, the other co-host of this event a bit later. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome people who registered from more than 20 countries uh, for this webinar this morning. Um, and that include countries right across the African continent, but also from the USA, from UK, and from even from Ukraine. So a quite an international audience that we have this morning. But then we are also most grateful that a number of organizations who play a very important role in promoting whistleblowing, and but also protecting whistleblowers, are also present here this morning. And they include the Whistleblowing International Network, Transparency International, Corruption Watch, the Independent Anti-Corruption Commission of Somalia, as well as the support to anti-corruption champion institutions in Ukraine. Um, so welcome to all of you, and I really hope that you will uh, use this opportunity to not only learn from our panel, but also to interact with our panel. And as Trevor already invited you to do, please make use of the Q&A in order to, to pose questions that you want our esteemed panel to respond to. The event is co-hosted by the Ethics Institute and Whistleblower House. Now, the Ethics Institute uh, was established in the year 2000 already, and um, it's an independent institute to focus on organizational ethics and the building of ethical culture in organizations. And um, we do this through thought leadership, through training, through products and services that we make available to organizations in both the public and the private sector, as well as in state-owned enterprises and professional associations. And we are delighted to also welcome a few of the non-executive directors of the Ethics Institute who are present here this morning, Mr. Muhammad Adam, Professor Divya Singh, Professor Arnold Smith, and Mr. Fulvio Tunelli. So a warm word of welcome to our directors as well. The co-host is the Whistleblower House. It's a, another independent non-profit organization who was established recently in 2021. And they focus on providing a holistic service to whistleblowers that include legal, psychological, security, financial uh, services that they give people access to, as well as with the conducting of risk assessments for whistleblowers. Now, moving closer to, and, and once again, I think just about all the uh, directors, as well as the executive director, of the Whistleblower House are present here this morning, but a special word of welcome to Mr. Ivan Pillay, who is uh, the chair of um, the Whistleblower House, and he will also do the closing at the end of the webinar. But let's start zooming in uh, in this Zoom meeting on the theme of, um, of this webinar, which is snitches get stitches and end up in ditches. Now, I think we all know that whistleblowing is a very important mechanism that we have to expose wrongdoing in organizations. And although the literature uh, on whistleblowing abound with uh, definitions and very different and sometimes even conflicting definitions of who a whistleblower is, I, can, I think we can work with a sort of rough and ready definition of a whistleblower as someone who reports wrongdoing to either a person or a body that he or she thinks can do something about the wrongdoing that, that they report. However, we also know that organizations do react very differently to these messages, these reports that they get from whistleblowers. In some cases, organizations react quite constructively and they listen to what whistleblowers bring to their attention, and they correct that. But very often, we don't hear about these instances because there's nothing spectacular to report here. And these whistleblowers who uh, find uh, a, a constructive response in the body or the person to whom they report that, those whistleblowers often remain beneath 
the radar and we don't hear about them and often we don't even think of them as whistleblowers. However, we also know that there's a very different and a very destructive response that whistleblowers often receive. And that is where instead of listening to the message, the messenger gets shot and sometimes also literally shot. Uh, we are only too aware of uh, the victimization that whistleblowers often suffer. And very often our association with whistleblowers are these people who are tragically affected by their courage to, to bring wrongdoing to the attention of their organizations. So the whole purpose of this webinar this morning <clears throat> is to look at how can we create organizational cultures where it is safe for people to report wrongdoing and where whistleblowers are actually appreciated for their contribution to transparency and accountability in their organizations instead of being victimized. And we will do so by having a panel conversation about the theme of this um, webinar this morning, which as you know now is snitches get stitches and end up in ditches. Uh, we unfortunately had to make uh, one change to, to our panel because of a whistleblower who is no longer available to participate, but I will leave it to um, the moderator of the panel discussion to tell you a bit more about that and also about uh, another very prominent whistleblower uh, who was willing to step in at fairly short notice. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague from the Ethics Institute, but also a founding director of the Whistleblower House, Dr. Liesel Frunewald, um, to tell us more about a panel and also to lead the panel conversation. Um, but let me just very briefly introduce you to, to Liesel. Liesel is a senior manager uh, at the Ethics Institute and she is our um, resident uh, expert also on whistleblowing uh, because that is one of the areas on which we focus as part of our focus on organizational ethics. She is the author of several publications on whistleblowing, including the Whistleblowing Management Handbook. And that handbook, by the way, is available on the website of the Ethics Institute. You can go down, go there and download a copy for free. And uh, then Liesl also contributed internationally to um, the, the drafting of the ISO 37002 standards on whistleblowing management systems. So I think someone who is really well qualified to lead this panel, but also to make a very substantial contribution to the topic that we will discuss this morning. So Liesl, I know you find yourself in Botswana this morning in Gaborone. So from Pretoria, a warm welcome to you there in Gaborone, and we look forward uh, to your panel conversation. Thank you very much, Dion, for the introductory remarks and introducing me. And yes, greetings everyone from uh, Gaborone, Botswana, and I welcome you all um, globally to this discussion uh, today. As Dion has indicated, um, Johannes Stephenson, who uh, the so-called fish rot uh, whistleblower, is unable to join us today. And he has sent a, um, a message saying that um, uh, I have and I am very limited and my ability is basically zero. I'm so sorry I cannot participate and not send a video. So Johannes is um, really sick. Um, and uh, yeah, he's just not able and doesn't have the energy to join us today. So let's just keep him in our thoughts and hope he feels better soon. Um, so I, I want to thank Johan van Lohrenberg for um, not being plan F, Johan, as he has indicated this morning, but plan B. Thank you so much for um, coming in at such a late stage or being willing to. Let me introduce my panelists. Um, I have Johan van Lohrenberg here today, Ben Tron and Lula Matabaka. Um, Johan is the former group executive uh, at the South African Revenue Service, where he worked for 16 years. 
After he blew the whistle on fraud and corruption, he was suspended and eventually resigned in 2014 by mutual agreement. Johan testified at, amongst others, uh, the Zondo Commission on State Capture um, in South Africa and a Section 194 inquiry into the South African public protector, uh, her fitness to hold office. Since 2015, he has been a practicing tax and customs advisor, a tax practitioner, an internationally registered conflict negotiator and mediator, member of various groups of civil society bodies. He remains an ongoing witness and complainant in an Inspector General of Intelligence case and is a potential witness in a number of state capture-related prosecutions. Johan is uh, the author of, amongst others, uh, the following books, Rogue, the Inside Story of SARS's uh, Elite Crime Busting Unit, Tobacco Wars, Inside the Spy Games and Dirty Tricks of Southern Africa's Cigarette Trade, Cop Undercover, My Life in the Shadows with Drug Lords, Robbers and Smugglers, Death and Taxes, How SARS Made Hitman, Drug Dealers and Tax Dodgers Pay Their Duties. Sorry, and lastly, he holds an LLB, a law degree, uh, and a postgraduate certificate in business management. My second panelist is Ben Tron. Ben is the CEO of the Whistleblower House and a certified fraud examiner, as well as a seasoned operations executive with 30 years experience. He holds an MBA from the University of Pretoria and has extensive experience in telecommunications, electronic tolling, and forensic investigations. A few highlights in Ben's career include the design and building of the Gauteng freeway tolling system in South Africa, refocusing the organization undoing tax abuse into a powerful anti-corruption fighting and lobby group with sustainable funding, establishing an anti-corruption branch in the Department of Public Enterprises and re-engineering and repositioning the ESCOM, uh, South Africa's Power Utility, um, their Forensic Investigations Unit, to conclude sensitive and critical uh, investigations. And our third panelist is from the Ethics Institute, my colleague Lulama Kabaka. Lulama was employed at the Armaments Corporation of South Africa uh, from 2016 to 2020 as a compliance and risk officer. During this time, he was tasked with implementing ethics in the organization, as well as the anti-bribery management system, aligned with ISO 37001. These activities led him to conducting ethics training for employees, drafting ethics-related documents, such as the code of conduct, fraud risk plans, as well as being involved in managing the whistleblowing hotline. He joined the Ethics Institute during COVID in February 2020 as an ethics and anti-corruption specialist, and he is our subject matter expert for state-owned entities. His role includes advising state-owned entities on ethics-related matters, conducting and compiling ethics risk assessments, and conducting ethics training for all levels across the organization. Lulama is a certified ethics officer, has a BCom law qualification, and is part of the Ethics Institute's faculty for the ethics officer certification program. And to add to his colorful personality, Lulama was a stand-up comedian in his previous life. Quite a mouthful, and you can hear that our panelists are really distinguished people who bring a lot to the table today from different angles so that we can focus on how to get our so-called snitches or prevent that our snitches get stitches and that they don't end up in ditches. Johan, if you can please um, uh, put on your camera so that uh, I can start with you. Then, according to media record, uh, records, you blew the whistle in 2015. Um, but I, I've, I've heard or you told me that you actually blew the whistle much earlier than that. 
um, and that it only came to the fore in the media in 2015. Won't you enlighten our audience, please, about what you blew the whistle on and how the process unfolded? Um, hello to everybody, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Well, uh, Lisa, let me say this. Um, to, to try and summarize it in the 10 minutes that you said I, uh, we have is going to be extremely difficult. But in a nutshell, if I, if I have to describe it um, very briefly, um, I commenced with making disclosures to persons in authority uh, towards December 2010 already, um, and, and in subsequent years, so in 2011, 12, 13, 14. Um, and it really concerned a myriad of um, uh, overlapping um, activities um, that concerned corporates, um, certain powerful individuals that had political connections, and in the main, our state intelligence um, agency. Um, but none of these uh, uh, disclosures were ever really acted upon. Um, in fact, they were quashed. And I think in part, that's the reason why it's not commonly known um, that I had begun to make these disclosures as far back as 2010. Um, what really brought it into the public domain, I think, was that in 2014, um, somebody who I had dated briefly um, and had ended the relationship with um, flipped the tables on me. Um, and how that happened was that towards end of 2014, um, one of the uh, um, disclosures I made, I did on, um, on instruction of my employer to the media. And this resulted in a media article in August of 2014 that exposed certain dirty tricks, if I can use that common term, to undermine our prosecuting authority, our police service, um, and the revenue service. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, over the weekend, I tried to find that article, which was a prominent article in the front page of a Sunday paper, and it had disappeared. It's nowhere available online. Um, in fact, all traces of these things have disappeared. Um, I think I, I, I became more publicly known as a result of those events because what then happened was that there were a number of, uh, let me call them one-sided inquiries um, who didn't hear me or didn't afford me a hearing, um, listened to the bad guys, um, accepted what the bad guys said as is, and as I said, turned the tables on me, and ultimately that became a pretext for a whole number of other enemies of the revenue service to not only um, quash what I had to say, but also use it to their advantage to ultimately capture the revenue service and get rid of a whole lot of other people. So it got a life of its own. And then in, in, in the post-2015 years, by the way, I resigned in 2015, not 2014, um, I probably became uh, uh, more publicly known as a result of my testimony in at the State Capture Commission, uh, my testimony uh, at a state uh, at a um, commission of inquiry um, in the at the Revenue Service, and and then as you said at the Parliamentary Committee um, recently in 2022. But at the same time, um, parallel to that, uh, the, the continuous hounding of myself and others um, continued um, through the use of uh, or abuse of the media and a whole lot of other platforms. And so for pretty much the last decade, I had spent a significant amount of time and effort um, together with other people in fighting the, the counterattack and the attempts to smear us, um, which succeeded by and large, um, falsely so, on various platforms. And then I, you know, that's, that was pretty much the last nine years of my life. Um, and every single time these things saw sunshine, of course, um, the truth 
uh, surface. So that, that's how I would summarize it in a nutshell. Yes, that, uh, thank you, Johan. That was uh, really a nutshell. Uh, but we will come back to some of what you have said, uh, definitely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me move over to Ben Bentron, the CEO of uh, uh, the Whistleblower House. Ben, um, Johan has not really touched on the detriments yet. I am going to ask him about the detriments and the consequences of his whistleblowing. But um, we we hear about this also on other on, uh, from other whistleblowers, and um, that is also one of the reasons why Johannes Stephenson can't be here today, of course. So, but there are continuous calls for people to inform the organisations or the public. Um, you know, about the observed wrongdoing, because if you don't know what's go what is wrong, you cannot fix it. So what I want to know from you is, uh, from the whistleblower house side, as you have experienced over the last year or two, um, what are the benefits of whistleblowing? Are there any benefits? Why do we need whistleblowers? Um, not just in organizations, but society in general. I know there's a, a, a quote from Johan that I have in one of my handbooks uh, where he says the world needs whistleblowers. Do you agree with that? Please give us um, just some background information in that regard. Thank you for the opportunity. Unemphatically, yes, the world needs whistleblowers. And as I go through a few slides that I put together, I think it's not only I, myself that thinks so, but also very learned people in this country and internationally. But I need to start off just by just sharing uh, what we as Whistleblower House have accepted as a definition, which is important that we understand what we regard as a whistleblower. And that is a person who in good faith, good faith, report wrongdoing in an organization to someone they believe will take action to address it. So there's a couple of factors in there that um, need to just to be uh, understood. So it is good faith in an organization and the person that you report to ought to be able to assist in that. Then I thought, let's just quickly look, because we based in South Africa and, and we always think that the world resolve, revolve around us and whistleblowers only in South Africa. It is not. But I thought, let me just put some examples up so the, the panel, the, 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 the uh, audience is international. So I thought, let me just share some examples of that. Uh, in 2015, SARS, Bain, uh, Ethel Williams, uh, 217 million um, is, is what was mentioned in the press. He resigned uh, and then he moved into exile and he's still in exile today. Trillion, uh, Bianca Goodson, 1.6 billion was repaid uh, to ESCOM because of that revelation and the work that's been done since then. She's resigned and for a very long time she couldn't find work. She is now employed um, and I think she's starting to rebuild her life. Um, SAA 2016, um, South African Airways, Cynthia Stimple. Uh, the value that we talk about generally is 250 million that you say, but the real, real value is 20 billion, which was involved in the purchase of the aircraft. Um, she is now my colleague in Whistleblower House, and we try to make a difference in the lives of whistleblowers. Prasa 2017, Mouth and Goy, uh, 2.5 billion is the contest in dispute. Been to court a number of times. She's still fighting on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, she's suspended and she's in court a lot of a lot of the times. Uh, let me pause. The Department of Health, 2021, Abita Diogran, 850 million were she identified 850 million um, in in transactions. She was murdered, and I think tomorrow. If I'm not wrong, tomorrow or Wednesday is the anniversary of her death two years ago. And I think we should just pause there to say, when people land up in ditches, we have many of them. And we need to remember people like Pete Babita, who have given, paid the ultimate price towards this. And they should not be forgotten. Quite the opposite. They should be celebrated. Uh, I thought let's go international. Um, from 1974, it's not a, it's a new, it's not a new thing. In 1974, Karen Silkwood, um, the Kerr McGee nucle nuclear plant, um, people were exposed to radiation, they died, she was murdered. In 1990, Environmental Protection Agency in America, William Marcus, Marcus, uh, he was dismissed. Pacific Gas and Electric Company, Aaron Brockovich, 
Um, she was fired. Uh, she was threatened um, with her life. She she started. Uh, she became a well known um, presenter for a series of um, magazine series, and she started her own organization called Brockovich Research and Consulting. Uh, Twenty thirteen. Edwin Snowden, um, he's in exile in Russia. Sorry, there's a duplication, I didn't pick it up. The Mauritius government in COVID, Supramanin, Kirsten, he was murdered. Uh, the DRC International Money Laundering, Gradi, Koko, Lobanga, and Navy Malela, they were in exile and they were sentenced to death in absence. In ab so they are still running and still hiding. And these people made a difference in their lives, in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've exposed corruption where they were. Um, what do whistleblowers go through? And you asked me the question, and Johan started talking, and if you hear from 2010, 2015, he resigned, um, until today. Um, Johan is doing freelance work, etc. But the things that I speak about here are, peop are things that people like Johan, people like Bianca, uh, Martha go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, whistleblowers report malfeasance, and unintentionally they become, without just the exception to the rule, uh, they become outcasts. They face civil and criminal persecution, and they get hounded. Loss of employment, defamation, ostracization, and isolation, and they have extreme difficulty in actually finding jobs because of that stigma attached to this uh, being a whistleblower. They experience post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. All too often, this is coupled with financial ruin, death threats, and as I've just spoken about Babita, even assassination. Let me talk about the value. Let's start there. Uh, Chief Justice, the highest legal person in our country, custodian of law and order, um, and the justice environment. The Commission has heard a lot of evidence from whistleblowers. If we do not look after these whistleblowers during state capture, they won't be around next time. Others will look at how we treat whistleblowers, uh, and they will not come forward. A lot of people are reporting corruption. That was three or four years ago when there's on the commission going on. Here is the here is the clause that I want to highlight. The whistleblower is one of the most effective weapons against corruption. This is a direct quote from. Uh, uh, Chief Justice. In most cases, the whistleblower has information that provides detailed uh, insight into here to unsuspected criminality, which is not really as ascertainable from routine inspection. This is confirmed uh, by the ACFE, um, Association for Certified Fraud Examiners, in the State of the State of the Nations Report of 2022, where they found that 42% of all cases that, that were identified actually come from tip. It's tips that came from, from, from people just letting people know that something is going wrong. And if you look on the right-hand side, who report, who are those people that give the tips? And 55% of those tips come from employees. So if you look at the ratio and the percentage of information that come through, valuable information, detailed information, Information can be followed through. I mean, if you, if you listen to, to Johan talk, he, he was inside the system. So when he talks, it's not a suspicion from somewhere that says, I think something's smelling. He says, here is the evidence. Evidence. I can back it up with evidence. This is the story behind the evidence. This is Ben doing wrong. This is Liesl doing X, Y, and Z, and then cahoots. And this is how the things fit together. And if you follow that, you, you will be able to identify and build a case very, very easily, as opposed to going from the outside into the system. Whistleblowers expose what I'm doing, and doing so benefit, and I'm talking your question, why are they important? They benefit not themselves. When I talk about this, I'm talking about individuals, me as a citizen in society, society, organizations, which is businesses, both big and small, corporates, government, or government departments, religious organizations. Uh, and, and the point that people forget is corruption has permeated every sector of society. Uh, it is not that the religious organization, or whether you're Jewish, uh, Muslim, Christian, doesn't matter which, corruption has permeated every piece of society, including religion. So 
we need to fight this with everything in in, in our beings. Impact is felt in. Now we think that um, corruption is is when you steal from the state. It is a there's no uh, not culprit opposite. Everybody suffers because of this. And where it is felt in in the organization companies, prices product prices goes up because there are losses. They need to recover the losses. Service delivery, and here we can talk about quality and quantity. If you look at the water systems in South Africa, if you look at electricity, services have collapsed in South Africa because of corruption. And that has now been accepted by everybody in the country. So we in the past, uh, we denied that we are responsible, we denied we're responsible. Everybody has accepted that corruption has affected society as it is right now. Education, water, electricity, safety and security. Whistleblower is often an early warning system, as I've just mentioned previous two slides, that expose wrongdoing way before the problem escalates. One example is the whistleblower Matepo Matapelo uh, More, who worked for Daybreak Farms, and Daybreak Farms is PIC funded. When the problem started a few years ago, it was less than 20 million. So she said, guys, there's something wrong here. Um, she's the CFO or the financial controller. Something is wrong here. People said, get lost. And they continued. Today, the problem has escalated 200 million. And that is just in one indication, one example of how things escalate if it is not addressed when you identify it as it starts. So when it starts, when it's born, we need to address that immediately. I want to end on this part of, of, of my discussion and talk about the, 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 the name of this presentation and the webinar. And when you shared it with me, I cringed because it, it, it is brutal, absolutely hard. But then I realized, but hang on, this is the truth. Snitches get stitches. And let's talk about the wording in, in those and just separate the two. And I'd like to share some insight into that. A snitch means in the old days, you're either part of a gang or you're part of a mafia, etc. And a snitch was very harsh connotation. It means betrayal. It's negative. Lives are at risk and you're exposed to danger. That's snitch. If you think of the word, that's okay. Snitches, it's a definite threat. Unequivocal, you will get hurt. Um, it's a warning that you will be injured and you will need medical, medical assistance. So st st stitches mean that. And the ditch means, remember in the old days, uh, we had gravel roads, no lighting. You will land up in a ditch means you will die. <coughs> there was very little other uh, connotation to you will you will die or you will go missing. And even in today's life, people go missing and they are never found. If you think about the apartheid days, there are still bodies that, are, that haven't been found, snitches that have disappeared. So in this context, that is the current connotation. And I'd like just to change the narrative as we move on to the next phase. And the whistleblower exposes wrongdoing. They bring wrongdoers to book. They stop financial bleeding, the leakages, and corruption. So they should be heroes, heroines. They should be celebrated and embraced. They should be rewarded. And in fact, it's absolutely celebrated and just embraced in South Africa. And I would like to be play a major role in this journey as we change from the first, the wording of this uh, webinar, to something where whistleblowers are absolutely celebrated and carried on our shoulders as heroes and heroines. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that insight and, and taking us to a more positive narr narrative as it relates to whistleblowing and whistleblowers. And we will also touch on a few of the points that you have uh, made. Um, there's one that particularly to me stand out, and that is um, the uh, um, uh, incentivizing uh, whistleblowers. But we will get to that. Uh, Lula, Lulama, uh, ben has mentioned that uh, in our country, in South Africa, and I believe uh, in many other countries that are represented here today, uh, that corruption has become the norm because, and, and I'm, I'm just now focusing on corruption and fraud, is it has become the norm. And as we very well know within an organizational context, if people don't, uh, speak up about what is wrong, as I've said in the beginning, what is wrong in the organization, the organization can just not do anything about it. 
Okay? And, and that is the, then it becomes the norm, um, as Ben has mentioned. So your focus is specifically on organizational ethics. And I use the name organizational, so that and not business, because we are talking about all organizations in whichever sector. And um, what I want to know, uh, Lulama, is can organizations not ensure that their employees um, and other stakeholders, such as their suppliers, such as their clients, anyone who blows the whistle on um, misconduct in that organization, um, can it not ensure that these people uh, are protected and listened to? Uh, that will also help. Okay, how can they create in an organization a safe space for um, whistleblowers to speak up? Thank you so much, um, Liesl. Um, you know, it's, it's whistleblowing in South Africa has got a very tough history, but from an organizational point of view, first thing that I find is for whistleblowing um, culture to take precedence, you need a healthy organizational ethical culture. So you need an organization that's not using words like so-called ethics or where ethics is taboo or where people speak about ethics in their passages where they speak about ethics very openly. That, that's, that's one of the, the the founding and key cornerstones in terms of having a healthy whistleblowing um, culture. Then secondly, you need a comprehensive whistleblowing policy. I find that whistleblowing policies are either found in a code of conduct, sometimes in a conflict of interest as just a small little section, but they don't go into detail in terms of what it is and how it should be um, implemented in the organization. And then you also need to have trainers and awareness programs. So we tend to have a lot of ethics awareness programs um, and training around ethics, but we never do around whistleblowing. Uh, so we just leave it into the air. We draft our, our whistleblowing policy and then it, it's left just like that. And then fourthly, we also need to look at, you know, when, when organizations um, use a, a, a service provider for whistleblowing, they need to use a reputable one. Okay, There's a lot of fly-by-night whistleblowing service, service providers out there. And it's important that you check their background and make sure that these people can actually deliver on the service that they said they're going to deliver on. And then fourthly, another thing that organizations don't do, which is, for me is the most important, is to do a risk assessment around a whistleblower. So for instance, when a whistleblower uh, reels um, information or details, you need to first establish when they've given you the information. Is it easy to identify that whistleblower? Is it easy to, to tell where that information came from? Number two, you need to be able to tell um, in, in due course, will the whistleblower be found out? Will the whistleblower actually suffer occupational detriment? And then you also need to look at the manager themselves, the people that they have been reported. Are they most likely going to take action against the whistleblower? What is the likelihood that the whistleblower will suffer occupational detriment because of what the managers know about them? So it's also important that you check what the managers are doing and sort of transfer them if you have to, but you need to protect the whistleblower. And then you also need to look at, is there a criminal element involved in there? Okay, if there's a criminal element involved in there, it's important that um, the, the, the relevant authorities are informed. And then a key thing for us, and this is where the whole thing about, is it a whistleblower, is it someone protecting themselves? If the whistleblower is involved in the very um, unethical conduct that, they be, that they're reporting, then the, you know, the, the dynamics change a little bit, uh, and then you need to treat it a little bit differently. Then you also need to look at the relationship of the whistleblower with, with the manager, as well as the relationship of the whistleblower with the organization itself. Um, and then lastly, you need to also look at uh, keeping the, 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 the information confidential and, and anonymous. And then you also have to look at other steps that you need to take. First one is you need to train managers, okay? So sometimes a whistleblowing mm -hmm. report comes to a manager, but the manager is not trained or well-versed in whistleblowing and, and handling confidential uh, information. So what they tend to do is they, they go and consult with everyone. Then the information gets out, and then everybody thinks the whistleblowing hotline is the one that gave away the information. But it's the manager inadvertently who was not aware that um, <laughs> that they shouldn't be sharing this information. It should be kept very small until the investigation has been completed. Then you also need to train the employees because employees also sometimes go uh, about it the wrong way around. They use um, organizational um, equipment such as the, your, your company laptop or they blow the whistle using the company telephone, or they even use their own personal cell phone. Um, and that one of the biggest things that employees tend to make a mistake on is actually talking about the very thing that they've reported. And the, the, the worst type you can find, I call them the chief mourner. These are the ones who go and blow the whistle 
and then they tell everybody in the organization about what just happened to them. So it's important that the employees are also um, trained on that. And then from the investigation uh, point of view, it's important that we sort of keep these things um, independent. You know, you cannot say to uh, the finance department, you've got a... Uh, you've got a particular issue and then ask the finance department to actually investigate. You need to make sure someone else who's not connected to the finance department is investigating the whistleblowing. And lastly, it's important that we need to keep it confidential. But that being said, Liesl, um, when it comes to a healthy whistleblowing culture, if you look at South Africa as a whole, we've got a very adversarial relationship with whistleblowing and it dates all the way back to the 1700s with our second Cape governor called Willem van der Stel. For those of you who think it's familiar, that is the guy who Stellenbosch was named after. Okay, so what this guy did, he pulled, uh, he used company resources. He worked for the Dutch East India Company. And with those company resources, he used employees. He managed to get himself a nice wine farm. He had a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep. Um, and one of the, the brave whistleblowers there, imagine that's all the way in the 1700s, uh, blew the whistle on him. And they did what we love doing in South Africa. They had a commission of inquiry. Okay, so that the commissions of inquiry, we've been doing them since the 1700s. They slapped Willem van der Stel on the wrist um, and he came back, but he sold his assets. But the first history or the first case of occupational detriment, we can trace it all the way back to Aram Das, who was actually locked up in the Castle of Good Hope. And if anyone has been there, you can see it's not a nice place to be locked up in, okay? Um, and that being said, Liesl, until we change um, societal views and societal relationship with whistleblowing, we won't see it trickle down into organizational ethics as well. So until we change our views on what whistleblowing is, it's going to be difficult for us to see a change also in the organizations as well. That being said, for all organizations that are here, I'd like to encourage you to download our whistleblowing toolkit. It's on our website. Uh, it's free. Don't worry. There's no hidden cost there. And I think it's a very good and useful practical tool in terms of how can you manage your whistleblowing hotlines and, and what other elements you should consider when you've got a whistleblowing hotline and management system. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you, Lulama, for giving us that um, view of what an organization should do. And um, yeah, it's that difference between should and could and don't, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think there we still have a long way to go, but um, yeah, we believe it can be done. Johan, um, you have heard um, Lulama talking about whistleblowers uh, who has been involved in um, unethical conduct or wrongdoing themselves. I have two points here that I want to make. Um, the one is, do you view such a person as a whistleblower or is it just a person reporting, someone who has been involved in the misconduct themselves? And then uh, Lulama has also spoke about the detriments as well as Ben, um, that a, a whistleblower suffers. And I know, for instance, in your case, there has been uh, three uh, burglaries um, at your home at different times, uh, some of them very well timed, or one of them at least. And so other than that, please tell us the what I call the silent detriments. I don't know if that is a correct term, but I mean, it's been years. Um, where are we? 23 years. Um, please tell us how it has impacted your life, as well as perhaps those close to you. <laughs> Again, I, I I would need a long long period to. You're welcome. <laughs> that. But let me let me respond to you and challenge maybe a few concepts um, in the hope of maybe spurring some debate and thinking around some of these items. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I think as Lilama has said, the activity of uh, reporting wrongdoing. Um, or highlighting it once you become aware of it, predates the term whistleblower um, by far. Um, so I think it requires some thinking um, on whether the term whistleblower requires better definition and whether it should include people who were beneficiaries of the wrongdoing or potentially even participants 
and who at the later stage, more for self-preservation than for any other motive, decide to speak up. Not that I'm diminishing uh, the value of such uh, testimony and, and, and evidence, but I do think, um, you know, there are two schools of thought. There's the one school of thought that lumps everybody um, of any category, whether they were beneficiaries or whether they accidentally come across wrongdoing, into the, the term whistleblower versus the other school of thought that, that makes that distinction. Um, that you perhaps become what's known as a state witness or a crown's witness um, versus somebody who voluntarily um, reports something that they happen to come across. So that's the one concept that I think requires some uh, debate and, and, and consideration. The other one is um, more speaks more to um, Ben's presentation. And that's this notion that people who, who, who report wrongdoing, um, voluntarily so, um, are deemed snitches or rats or outcasts. I would challenge that. I think, um, you know, there, there are many facets to this, but first of all, I think in a general sense, um, the people who tend to see whistleblowers, as snitches or rats and threats and bad people are precisely the people that the whistle is being blown upon. Um, I don't think that the general populace ordinarily would consider somebody who reports wrongdoing, whether it's corruption, fraud, or any other type of wrongdoing as a snitch. I don't think so. I, I would challenge that notion. Um, but what I do think happens, and that speaks to the consequences of whistleblowing, is that often um, when you blow the whistle against powerful people or people with resources um, that enable them to threaten you or harm you or those uh, close to you and try to squash you um, and shut you down, um, there's this thing almost like the bullying effect. Um, other people, good people around you, tend to isolate you because they become afraid of getting drawn into the fray. And so that's an indirect consequence, certainly something that I experienced, is that the minute that they came for me, people who I have known for 16 years as colleagues suddenly disappeared out of my life overnight. Um, and I had not spoken to many of them for many, many, many years until the truth surfaced. And then uh, some of them had the, you know, felt a bit more comfortable to engage with me and speak to me. But at the time when this happened, I was completely isolated. Um, I was alone. I, I was on my own. So that speaks to, I think, this notion of being an outcast and a snitch. I don't think any of those people that stayed away from me or avoided me considered me as a snitch. I just think they were afraid of getting drawn into the fray and suffering the same kind of harm that I was suffering at the time, which began with uh, an immense public onslaught to attack my character. And then later on, I think um, it became worse. It, you know, the threats came direct threats, phone calls from people. Um, people saying to me, in fact, I received a, a, a WhatsApp from a gangster. He, he was that um, brazen to, to tell me, you know, my end is near. Um, and from state security agency people who called me. Um, and that sort of, you know, it became worse than this. Then came the, the robberies, the invasion of my privacy, um, and then later on, the state machinery was, uh, because it had been captured by then, was then repurposed with a view to um, further try and, you know, diminish us and, and take us out of the equation and silence our voices. Simultaneously, there were these so-called uh, inquiries, which none of them actually called me in to say, listen, what's your side of the story? And to the extent that I did have an ability to engage with them and put to them the evidence, 
when you read the so-called reports, it's as if nothing that I'd given them ever existed. In one case, um, the Inspector General of Intelligence, everything I'd given them disappeared, mysteriously uh, dis disappeared. So, um, and lost, and nobody to date has explained where it's gone. You know, it's, it's never seen light of day. So I think this concept of impimpy, snitch, rat uh, is something I think we need to also debate and think about. Who are, who are whistleblowers rats to? I don't think the general uh, pop population at all. I think many people do think we are heroes, which brings me to the last um, notion that I'd like to challenge, and that is, I think, uh, you know, the... The act of, of, of going along in your life happily um, and then stumbling across evidence or information of something wrong and then responding to it by making it known to authorities with a view to try and stop it or, or have it addressed is a very natural human action. Um, it's ordinary. It's not heroic. It's ordinary. And it should be ordinary. Um, the question I always pose is, if you're walking down the street and you see somebody else across the street about to fall into a ditch, um, what are you going to do? Stand and watch them fall in the ditch? Or are you going to step across the road and tell them, be careful, don't fall into the ditch? And so for me, that's also something that I think requires a bit of thinking and debate around. Because it's, to me, it's the perfectly normal thing to do. Certainly in, in, in my case. But the difference is this, is that when you do that, you often don't realize and consider the consequences. Um, in some cases, the consequences may be exactly that. Well, what you, you hope. So you go and report wrongdoing to the authorities. And, sit, and there are good examples of that. And then there are also instances where, in fact, it backfires on you. Um, but that's something that occurs post facto. It does not occur at the time when you just naturally respond to the knowledge of wrongdoing. Um, let me leave it there. I mean, the, the consequences to, to whistleblowers are well documented. You know, it's, mm. um, the life changes permanently, forever, for the rest of your life, dramatically so on all levels, and you will never be the same person again. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, you have given us a number of challenges here, which I quite like, and things that we, uh, areas that we need to dis, um, discuss further. The uh, one thing that while you were talking, I was thinking that, all right, this negative uh, use of snitches and rats and traitors and all of those things. Um, it is perhaps something, um, a, a narrative that is more or words that are more promoted by ourselves, um, as, as maybe some practitioners and then, um, organizations specifically and perhaps the media. And uh, we need to find alternative, um, uh, descriptions. The, um, Okay, you have mentioned a couple of important things that I will touch on a little bit uh, as we go on. Hopefully, there are a number of questions coming through. And um, I, uh, Ben, but before we get to the questions, I want to ask you, uh, Johannes mentioned some of the things that of some of the detriments and consequences that um, goes with uh, being a whistleblower. And um, also the... Uh, the, if the, the the point that to him it came naturally or it will come naturally to report on wrongdoing. Um, there is a study of experiment, not just an experiment. There was a, a, a case uh, many, many years ago. They call it the Genovese uh, effect. It's a bystander effect where uh, I speak a little bit on a correction where 37 uh, neighbors of uh, Miss Genevieve saw uh, how she is being attacked and none of them did anything. They looked out of the window and none of them did anything. Uh, so I want to know um, your your opinion, Ben, um, 
from the whistleblower house's perspective have people come to the fore do are there only whistleblowers uh, that uh, are the only whistleblowers that we know of people that we read in the media high profile whistleblowers such as Johan, uh, such as many of the other people that have been mentioned worldwide, uh, people like Snowden, people like Johanna Stephenson, uh, who reported on huge corruption and in South Africa's case, uh, state capture. But um, at, at the whistleblower house, uh, has anyone come to the fore? Are we helping people? And then with what kind of services um, do they ask most? Thank you. The names that I mentioned is probably probably five percent of people that come forward, and then they become public uh, publicly known. Uh, the reality is there are many, many other people that do blow the whistle. They're under the radar. Bear in mind that the whistleblower house is not as well known as what you what you think it should be. Uh, because we don't go out and market ourselves. Um, we kind of offer services. We are available on the web. We're available for people to ask for help, and we help people. Uh, but we are not as well known as what we'd like to be. <clears throat> I think we are much less known as uh, people like Corruption Watch, etc., because we're not in the media all the time. But to give you some sense, at the end of July, a few days ago, uh, we had 187 whistleblowers um, talking to us and getting our ask for services, etc. Of those, and, and this gives you an idea of the need, where the needs are that whistleblowers need, 166 actually need legal advice, either before or after blowing the whistle. So there's a very high percentage that actually need legal advice. Uh, 84 needs counseling of the 187. That is extremely high as well, bearing in mind that South Africa as a group, and we, we speak to the uh, Psychological Society of South Africa. We had Dr. Well, Professor Seth Cooper on, on this platform where we spoke about how South Africa, as South Africans as a whole, are traumatized. So the whistleblower forms part of that cohort, and but they are more traumatized because of what they go through. And 84 of the 187 need um, psychological services, which we provide. Um, 50 ask for safety and security because they, they believe their lives are in danger. And we go through a process to evaluate what that means and exactly what they need. Because sometimes people think they are being followed, but it's coincidence. Other times they are real threats, and then we address that, etc. And then 16 needed financial assistance. Those are people that have lost their jobs. Um, they can't keep the kids in school. They're about to lose their houses. They can't pay for just amenities, electricity and water and they are hungry. So that gives you some indication of uh, the need that whistleblowers have and then where the major need is in that. People are traumatized. They need legal help because the PDA is uh, new in South Africa. There are not many. And there's a, there's a question that I just want to answer while I'm on this topic. Um, do, should we be doing, should we be doing um, training for labor uh, people in the in, in the lawyers, uh, CCMA, labor court. Absolutely. The difficulty we have is the PDA right now is being re reviewed, rewritten completely. So we need to educate the legal environment when it comes to the rights and what is expected of the whistleblower. But we also need to take a long-term view that we need to start working with society so that rats, rats and snitches and those kind of words are not acceptable. So when somebody calls somebody a rat, your colleague, your neighbor, your church co congregant should call them out and say, that's not acceptable. These people are doing it for society, so just shut up. There's a couple of strong words I can put in there. Uh, people that know me know how I talk. Uh, I want to give them a clap. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> All right, Ben, make reference to the PDA, which is the Protected Disclosures Act in, in South Africa. And there's a question. I see Lulama's hand is up, and uh, it will be great. I assume, uh, Lulama, you want to say something on what Ben has said. And then I also want to ask you, it's a question from, um, I think it's a question from uh, Devisham that says, uh, you know, what is 
your view, it's a panel question, but uh, what is your view on internal reporting? Uh, we know that the, uh, currently the Protected Disclosures Act says one must first exhaust internal reporting mechanisms before reporting outside of the organization. And we also know for our international uh, guests, um, the Protected Disclosures Act in South Africa is undergoing this consultation on how it should be uh, amended to actually really protect uh, whistleblowers, whether it will be able to do so, uh, we are yet to see. Lulama, your opinion on internal reporting, please. And then I took it that you wanted to say something on what Ben has said. Thanks, Liesl. Um The hand went up accidentally. I was switching from oh, okay. my, my phone to, because we had load shading. So, you know, we, we, we all know okay. that has gone problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, from an internal reporting perspective, I think the one thing we, we don't consider, especially as organizations, is we don't look at the role of middle management in organizations. And mm -hmm. middle management plays a very important role in reporting of, of issues as well as the management of the details and the information there. And let me maybe go into a little more detail. If you look at when we look at an ethical culture, we see the tone from the top managers, from the executives, and then very little from middle management. And we don't empower those middle managers to become informed in terms of what it is that we're looking for from an ethical culture and how it is that we can improve our ethical culture. So more often than not, you find um, no, no, no shade to anybody, but you find a guy from primary school and high school, they used to hang out in the library and all they did was study. They get to university, they pass summa cum laude, and then they get into their workspace and they're excellent at it. And then suddenly they're promoted to middle management but they've got the same people skills as Steven Seagal, okay? So zero personality skills, and that's how they manage their, their employees. Now, whistleblowing happens, and this employee doesn't want to be involved um, in, in, in issues, and they don't want to rattle the cage. Now, the, the problem that we have in organizations is we don't give managers at all levels a way out. Um, and I think Johan mentioned it very, very um, earlier on to say that um, most people don't believe in snitches and it's a very human thing to become defensive. So we don't empower managers to say, listen, if you are faced with a case such as this one, these are the options that you have. And these are some of the things that you should start doing to investigate the case. And also you don't have to push back and defend um, off the bat, but you can actually, there's ways of you defending the, the, the issue. I mean, investigating the, the, the so-called case and finding out what is it that we can do to sort of fight, get to the bottom of this without you feeling like you're being attacked. So it's important that mm -hmm. managers don't feel attacked when a safe reporting um, case comes out. So that's the first one. And then with the Protected Disclosures Act, it's a very good act. Um, it's a good case. And just to answer um, Ms. Moodley's um, question, it's a good act. But unfortunately, we've seen that acts really become robust when they are followed by more regulations. So we haven't really given enough thought to it. Uh, you know, if you look at the PFMA, the PFMA has got a lot of instructions from Treasury. You get a lot of instructions from the Auditor General until the PDA Act has also got a lot of instructions in terms of these are the recommendations. Um, this is how we, we recommend that you should implement certain issues. We're not going to see much of a change. Um, it, it's just an act that's there. It's almost like a tick box, but we haven't really figured out the nitty gritties and how to actually manage it in practical senses. Um, and also, we haven't, we have, we're not seeing enough um, whistleblowing awareness training and, and enough whistleblowing um, implementation plans within organizations. It's not seen as part of the strategy. It's a reactive thing. It's not being managed in a proactive manner. So, yeah, I'd like to park it there. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's always reactive. And it should be proactive. Uh, and I agree completely with your middle, middle managers that need to have that um, exposure to training on how to handle confidential information, how to keep the identity of the whistleblower confidential. We saw in a study that the Ethics Institute did in 2019 that 42% 42, 42 of employees reported uh, to their middle managers or their direct line managers, whereas only 2% reported to the internal hotline or whistleblowing facilities. Um, there, thank you. Uh, there are uh, questions, and and one of it has to do with incentivizing whistleblowers. And I want to put this to all three of you, uh, Johan and Ben, as well. Please, um, we saw that the Security Exchange in the uh, United States paid seven hundred and twenty-one 
million uh, US in 2022 to whistleblowers. Now, we know this is only um, applicable to certain financial crimes. The United Kingdom are also uh, incentivizing certain um, circumstances. And then in the comments that have been given, I think some of the comments that have been given now in South Africa on the Department of Justice's uh, recommendations for enhancement of our Protected Disclosures Act, there is an opinion or there is uh, recommendations that a whistleblower fund uh, be established. Johan, what is your view on um, incentivizing uh, whistleblowers? Wouldn't it undermine the morality of a whistleblower? Yeah, Liesl, I, again, I think there, you know, there appears to be two primary schools of thought on this. Um, one being, you know, for uh, rewarding mm -hmm. in financial terms. And then the other one, not. Um, I'm inclined to um, veer towards the no reward for the simple reason that, I, you know, what I said earlier on, I think it's a perfectly natural thing. We should expect it of each other to when we go about our normal daily life and we see something wrong, um, that we should report it to the authorities and expect the authorities to respond to that. And, and that should be normalized. It should not be um, treated as something um, extraordinary or unique. I'm concerned that it may turn uh, the notion of doing the right thing from a value perspective mm. into some form of bounty hunting. That, that worries me a little bit. But having said that, I do think one should look at cases individually because there may well be um, scenarios where some form of recognition may well be justified. Um, and, it, it, you know, there are many things that jump to mind when I say that. And so I wouldn't absolutely dismiss it. But I don't think that finances, um, a financial reward, is per se the default automatic general response to somebody who's done what I think we should all naturally do. Mm. Well, thank you for um, that input. So uh, let's hear, Ben, from your side, what is your view? Should we or shouldn't we incentivize whistleblowers? I just want to clarify before I do that. Um, you spoke two things as if it's one. A fund should be created. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and, and I just want to clarify that the fund is not meant as an incentive. It is to make sure that when a whistleblower blows the whistle uh, and they get fired, they have an income. So that fund, is okay. what the, the intention there is, is to ensure that the whistleblower can survive, they've got an income, etc. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, the current environment when it comes to witness protection is, is absolutely not conducive to whistleblowing at all. And I know that I don't I don't want to confuse whistleblowing to witness, but you've got to bear in mind that the witness protection environment is is a very clinical environment where they put you in protection and what happens, and I don't want to go into detail, but it's it's very lonely there. And the idea of that that we'll be moving towards with uh, whistleblowing is that you should not be lonely. Uh, and it's much deeper than just having a quick conversation that says things must happen. We need to change the culture in South Africa. And we are talking to organizations such as the religious organization, government, that speaks to the culture of whistleblowing, where people deep-seated, we have cultural problems in Africa, and we need to go understand that before we start talking whistleblower as one portion of that. But we need to change the environments in Africa where we have become a very violent society. That needs to be addressed. Uh, corruption is rife. We need to address that. So it is not only the whistleblower, but we need to have a societal reboot to do that. We have not, and myself and Johan speak quite regularly, and, and as you can hear, the two of us speak robustly about, about the topics that we speak about. Uh, we as a whistleblower house have not made a final decision whether to do it or not, because you have the tensions. We believe that the option should be there, but once the option is there, you can't take it away. Now, mm -hmm. you have to put criteria in, and potentially that would help. But I just wanted to make sure that you understand that the 
audience around the table understand there are two discussions. The one is a fund that speaks to supporting whistleblowers in their time of need as they move forward versus um, the, the compensation that you get three or five or 10% from, from any monies um, uh, that be that recouped. Mm -hmm. Which is then mostly after the fact. Uh, Lulama, your opinion? Okay, I'm in between the two opinions that were expressed here. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the first one is the, the whistleblower needs to be compensated for any financial losses they may have suffered. And then I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to compensate them for a bare minimum, um, like it should be a minimum threshold to say that this is for the psychological effects and all the occupational detriment that they suffered. So this is just a, a, a small um, amount that is awarded to them. And then I, I do worry about the bounty hunting because there will be people who become professional whistleblowers. They move from organization to organization and somehow they expose wrongdoing and get rewarded. So that's also another thing that I'm a bit wary of. Um, and of course, you know, we can't forget the country that we live in. Uh, last thing we want to see is um, 10 million rent disappears from whistleblowing fund. That is a very real risk because we've seen it happen in all organizations. So we need to be very cognizant of where the fund resides, who are the people who are going to be looking after the fund, and, and what is the fund going to be used for and how is it going to be dispersed. If we, if we don't agree on that, and then I think we are going to see more of the same because how many anti-corruption and uh, ethical um, departments do we see, but nothing gets done, especially if the fund is not given any teeth in terms of disbursements, um, then it could it could go the other way around. Well, thank you, Anpeeps. We've um, heard now two different, uh, different opinions, like you say, in between. Yeah, I'm also this way or that way. It depends, I suppose. And... Uh, and I know uh, the, at the SEC, um, apparently there has been some people who have become um, sort of career whistleblowers, according to some reports, uh, who go out to find something to blow the whistle so that they can get um, all, well, they can get some rewards. Um, now, in terms, I have to come back to South Africa at the moment, um, is what is, as panel again, what is your opinion in terms of should there be an independent, should we establish in South Africa um, an independent and dedicated anti-corruption structure? This was recommended by uh, Chief Justice Sondu. And uh, in, some in some countries, there are such structures I uh, maybe we can hear in the or see in the chat whether those structures have been successful. Uh, from what I read, in terms of certain ones, uh, it has not been successful because it has been infiltrated, so to speak, uh, by um, some characters, uh, intent of making uh, some money out of it. Or should we go for a Chapter Nine institution in South Africa, or should we just? rely on corporates and, and the public service uh, to make sure that their whistleblowing management is of such nature that our whistleblowers um, are not victimized, that are encouraged, that the employees, the stakeholders, also uh, external stakeholders are encouraged to blow the whistle for the right reasons. Johan? Yeah, well, um... I think the world gives us some examples of this. Um, the developed world tends to um, favor um, dedicated structures and bodies that um, that manage and handle and take ownership of the concept of whistleblowing in their societies. And even in some developing countries, you have that. I think... Um, it, from a South African perspective, um, I think our track record when it comes to creating uh, organizations and new bodies and new institutions and new departments is not that great. So um, I'm uncertain whether the, the solution lies in immediately jumping to create a new body 
at this stage. I think fundamentally and ultimately it should exist. But I think to begin with, the question should be where in government or elsewhere does the ownership of whistleblowing and whistleblowers uh, lay? Now, that's where I disagree with Lumalu because I don't think the Pub Protected Disclosures Act is worth the paper it's written on. There are not even punitive consequences to people who who cause harm to whistleblowers in that act. Um, so I think, and I don't know who owns whistleblowers. Where do whistleblowers go when they have a problem? Um, where do we go? Who should we complain to? I mean, in my case, you know, I I went as high up as the presidency. I spoke to members of parliament. Uh, I went to the public protector. I spoke to my employer. Um, I spoke to heads of other departments in the police, directorate of priority crimes and so on. Not a single one of them heard me. So I think fundamentally for me, it's about ownership. Where does that rest? Once you have established statutory ownership of whistleblowing, the concept, then as we are developing state and a constitutional democracy, the, the mechanism by which you take ownership and manage that ownership can develop uh, organically. Um, like I think we've seen with institutions that, that do work as opposed to ones that come about on the back of an idea only, you know. It tends to distract us. We focus more on who's going to head it, who, where, what's the budget going to be, what officers do they use, um, what are their powers, who do they report to, et cetera, et cetera. And it completely distracts um, from, uh, you know, it'll take too, too long, actually. Yeah. No, and we know it takes forever, basically. You're quite right there. The focus is completely wrong with these organizations. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan. Um, ben? The difficulty we have is that we put structures in place so that accountability and reporting and watchdog, all those things are in place. The difficulty we have is the actual work behind the, the mm. that stands behind that, and very little accountability is being seen in South Africa. If you look at um, over the recent years, um, SSA, what oversight bodies took place over there, and what happened, um, the amount of corruption that was reported to Parliament, more than one whistleblower has spoken to us the way Johannes just said. I wrote to the president. I wrote to the Parliamentary Oversight Committee, I wrote to the Minister, and they just kept ignored uh, because mm -hmm. there are other powers at, at play that stop accountability of taking place. And, and so it doesn't help you put structures in place if you don't adhere to the rules and regulations that you put in place for that. And in fact, you need to hold people to account every day. You can't pick and choose that you want to hold Lisa to account, but Ben can get away with murder. Um, everybody should be held to the, to the same level, um, and we need to hold people to account and ensure that accountability is done properly and so that people have, uh, they can feel um, what happens. Um, the sad thing is, and I need to put it on the table, we shouldn't shy away from it. The Zonda Commission made very strong recommendations. He found uh, quite a number of people that have cases to answer for. How many of those people have been put into positions over the last two years of power, of very high profile environment and what does this, that say about how serious government is taking the Zondo Commission recommendations and, and, and the statements and utterances you made because if you continue appointing uh, people into positions of power despite having a cloud hanging over your head you are not serious. Thank you. Mm. Thank you Ben. Uh, Lulama, just uh, there's still a few uh, questions that I want uh, just uh, for us to deal with. Uh, so just hang in there for a moment. Um, one thing just for our international audience is we are talking about um, the Zonda Commission um, and uh, what what this commission was looking into state capture specifically 
And as at, uh, at the end of the day, it made a, a number of recommendations, uh, is, uh, especially in terms of uh, and and the test of uh, most of our whistleblowers, um, or many of the people that has been in the media as whistleblowers in South Africa, uh, testified at the Zona Commission, and um, the findings pointed to the fact that there are people in high, very high positions that needs to be held accountable, which has not been happening at all. So I think, uh, as panel members, you will agree with me that we have a problem in our country. And I know in some other countries as well, we, uh, people have spoken up about huge, uh, high levels of corruption that, um, the perpetrators are not held accountable, but instead they get new positions and increases and, and, and salaries and so on. Just the last question, um, Lulama to you from the, from our, uh, Q and A session here is, um, there's a comment by Devushim that talks about, uh, no, before we can even look at the Protected Disclosures Act, uh, we need to understand what is, um, what are the statistics uh, in the country? How many whistleblowers do we have? Uh, what are the things that they blow the whistle on? Um, in your opinion, um, is that something that we should focus on or should we perhaps rather focus on how we can increase uh, or, or create uh, th those safe spaces where people can actually blow the whistle and where they will be protected, not only by the organization, but eventually by the law. Uh, because I think most of us agree with Johan that the current law is not worth the paper that it that it is written on. You have one minute. Thank you, Lisa. Um... If you look at how 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 this has been has played out in in the public discourse, I, I don't even think it's worth looking at the statistics because it's just going to discourage people even more. I think what we need to look at is publishing those cases where um, whistleblowing was successfully investigated, it was managed well, and they came to a conclusion, and the whistleblower was actually given feedback. And then maybe we can start learning from there in terms of what is what is it that we can do going forward as organization? And what are some of the good examples that we've seen from a governance point of view? I think I've hit that under one minute. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lulama. All right, one last word, please. Uh, just some advice, uh, some encouragement from each of you. Uh, Johan, your last profound statement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but look, I think, um, you know, in the end, uh, we all have to live with our own consciences. And so when we go about life um, in all uh, ways, where we come across something that's wrong and it causes harm to people and in, in the environment and society, do not hesitate to make it known. And uh, the purpose of making it known should be to put a stop to it and hold people to account. It doesn't matter what follows, because in the long run, I think um, that's, that's just the state of flux. In the long run, things will come right. But if you hesitate and you stop and you don't do anything, um, you're not just harming society and the environment and, and the public, but also future generation. Thank you. Thanks. Positive words. Ben? Lulama? Whistleblowers, whistleblowers are needed, not only in South Africa, but worldwide. What is needed Thank is that to change the environment so that they can come forward, so that they are protected, so that they are um, Calibrated all the other words. Um, there's not enough time for me to tell you how I feel about this topic, but they are needed, and we are ready to do to to work towards this. Bear in mind that the one thing I want to encourage people: the deadline for submissions to the Department of Justice was last week and Tuesday. There will be another opportunity because once they draft the legislation, they have to come out again for new for, for new comments, etc. And I would like to encourage people to use that opportunity because it's only with our participation that our future will be crafted. We cannot stand here and say, they should have. 
we must contribute to that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Lulama, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for potential whistleblowers and the future whistleblowers, not reporting on unethical conduct is not an option. If you've seen unethical conduct, you must report on it. But I would like to encourage you to first do your homework, get advice from uh, the, the different uh, spheres of, 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 of um, governance, from legal, from a um, finance perspective, as well as the criminal um, element of it. But make sure that you're covered. Put your safety first before you, you go out and, and blow the whistle. And once you've done it, word of advice, shush. Okay, yeah. shush until it's resolved. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this discussion. I am going to hand over to the chairperson of the Whistleblower House, for which we are most thankful for his um, his leadership. Uh, Ivan, if you can perhaps just conclude, close the session for us and uh, perhaps open your webcam. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, Good, good, good days um, to all the participants. I see it's about 200 now. Um, let me first thank um, uh, the panelists, uh, Johan, Ben, and Lulama. A special thank you to uh, Lisa and uh, Professor Dion Russell for opening the, the webinar. And uh, of course, for all the technical support. Um, Lisa has done a good job in, in a very, very good job in, in the discussion. So I'm going to avoid um, uh, talking about the, uh, <clears throat> the, the content of the discussions, I want to make uh, just two points and then I end. Um, the one is that we're operating in a context and all the participants have made uh, um, reference to that. And that whilst we should do everything to support whistleblowers and encourage them. We've got to impact on society as a whole. And in this context, just one thing that I want to say is that elections are coming up next year. A question we should ask ourselves about participants the Ethics Institute and the Whistleblower House, is how do we put this issue onto the election platforms? We have an opportunity and we should, we should think very seriously about this. And what is more, we should put it on, we should be asking the key players in the elections, what are you going to do about this? concretely, practically. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to, 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 all, to all the participants and well done.